This sermon is titled James chapter 2 Be enriched as you listen All right so right now we are studying God's word which book are we studying James <laughs> this little quiz okay so we just started looking at uh, the epistle of James last week and uh, we're going to go through it verse by verse, uh, chapter by chapter, and look at what the Lord wants to speak to us, teach us through this episode. Now, in, if, in case you missed a previous message, you can always go to our church website, uh, the video, the audio, the sermon notes, and everything, everything is there. So I encourage you to please uh, refer to that, listen to it, put it on your phone, listen to these messages. And uh, interestingly, you know, uh, all our sermons from 2004 are available on our church website, just in case you didn't know that. So that's uh, almost, almost 18 years worth of sermons, sermon notes, and uh, from the time we started doing the video, the videos are also up there. So it's a, it's a repository of uh, uh, preaching and teaching, and uh, you know, uh, I was just looking at, you know, we have, of course, a lot of analytics that go on behind the website, and we have more than three million downloads of stuff from our website. That's huge. That's from almost every nation of the earth. Uh, people are coming and using the resources of, available on our website. So we're here in Bangalore, but the nations are using the resources available. So uh, thank God for that. And, uh, you know, and it's growing. It's growing week after week, you know. But I encourage you, those of us sitting here in Bangalore, go ahead and use those resources. Um, uh, there are books available, PDF versions. Now we've started coming up with the audio versions of books. And interestingly, our books are available in other languages. I think there are, uh, again, I don't know the exact number, but I think we are doing 11 Indian languages and five international. So we're doing Spanish, German, French, Russian, uh, I don't know what else. So the books are being translated in, in other languages. So just go ahead, use the books, uh, uh, use all these resources that are available uh, on our church website. All right, we stopped at verse 18. Uh, sorry, verse 17, last Sunday in James chapter 1. So we're going to pick up from James chapter 1, verse 18 onwards. So uh, please follow along with us uh, in, in uh, your Bible, or the scriptures will also come up on the screen. James chapter 1, verse 18. Our goal is to uh, finish chapter 2 as well. So let's see how, how well we do uh, with that. You know, one of the things I missed out last Sunday when we were talking about doing a author profile talking about James last Sunday is that James, whom we mentioned that he, he was a half-brother of Jesus, he actually died as a martyr, as one of the many martyrs in the New Testament church. So he gave his life, 80, around AD 62, it was when uh, he was martyred. Uh, he, because he was a leader in the, the church in Jerusalem, uh, he faced a lot of opposition from the religious leaders uh, there, and they forced him. They brought him to the temple, the pinnacle of the temple, uh, as, a, as a story records. Uh, they brought him to the pinnacle of the temple. They forced him, demanding that he deny the faith. You know, and he refused, of course. He said, no, I'm not going to deny. And uh, they threw him down the pinnacle, and they, you know, they crushed him on the ground. So he died as a martyr for the faith, along with several other people who died as martyrs. So that's something important to know about James. He gave his life for what he believed in, in the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's pick up in James chapter 1. We're going to read verses 18 through 25. James 1, uh, 18 through 25. You got your Bibles ready? Yes, I'll read it. Okay. James 1, 18 through 25. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. 
Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word that is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. So now, you know, like we mentioned last Sunday, James is addressing various topics that would be of immediate interest to his audience. And now he, he focuses his topic, or he moves now, to talking about the Word of God. The Word of God. And how we should relate to the Word. Now I want us to keep in mind that when he says the Word of God, what they had at that time in the, in the early church, and what you and I have today is very different. Or, I should say very different. They didn't have everything that we have today. So at the time when James was writing, all they had was the Old Testament. They didn't have the entire Bible. So when James is referring to the word of truth, he's referring to the Old Testament as they had it, and the word that was being passed on by the apostles by word of mouth. That was all they had. So they had what we would refer to as the gospel, the teachings of Jesus, but not in written form. They had it as a word that was preached to them through the apostles. Are you with me? So what he tells us here in verse 18 is, he says, we've been born again by the word of truth. The word of truth, that is the word of God. The Old Testament and the message the apostles have communicated to them. By that word, he says, look, we believers, we've been born again as first fruits of this new creation. I mean, these are the, we are the early believers. So remember, this is approximately the first, you know, around 10 to 12 years after the church has been born. So he's saying, you know, we believers are the first fruits, the first set of people who've, who've been born again, have come to faith by the word of truth. And having come to faith, verse 19 and 20, here is how we should conduct ourselves. Because why? We are now new creatures. We've been born of this word of truth. And so then in verse 19 and 20, what he's impressing on them is, brethren, if we've been born of the word of truth, there has to be a change in how we live. Amen? There's got to be a change. And what does he point to right away? Verses 19 and 20, he says, my beloved brethren, Be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to get angry, because when you're angry, you don't do what's right in the eyes of God. So there's got to be a change. We are born of God. We are born of the word of truth. And now there has to be a change in how we live. And the first thing he's saying is, how you speak, how you listen, and how you manage your temper. Are you listening? It's like three knockout punches. <laughs> right there, you know. Be slow to speak. Take control of your tongue. And Nirmal pointed that out from James 3 as well. So he's, he's going to talk a lot about how we control our tongue. Be slow to speak. Be more eager to listen. And be slow to get angry. Because when you do get angry, you don't end up doing what's right in the eyes of God. Now we can all relate to this. We can all relate to this. I mean, there's probably, you know, numerous stories we can all say. Man, if I had just listened one more minute, just listened a little longer, I would have understood the other person's position or under, understood the, where that person was coming from. And I would not have been so hasty in, you know, coming up with that decision or whatever, you know, we did, which we will then, which we later regret 
if we had just listened a little longer. And you know, this is something you and I, you know, can look to God and say, God, give me grace to do this. Give me grace to do this. We just listen. And this is so important even in the workplace, right? You know, just because this is a little secret, just because you work for church doesn't mean everything is like heaven. Now, our church staff can tell you. I mean, just don't, don't make that assumption. We're all people. And, you know, we can get tense. Things can get tense. You know, when things aren't done right or they're not, they're not done the way they're supposed to be or, you know, all those things. And then, you know, and I've gotten angry in the church office. Confession. <laughs> you know, when, when things aren't done the way they're supposed, something's gone wrong, I've gotten angry. And there are times, you know, I, I wish I just listened. Maybe I would have understood the other person's side a little more. Why, you know, whatever happened, happened. And I said, oh, God, I'm so sorry. Then, of course, I apologized to that person. I said, hey, I'm really sorry. I, I lost my cool or, you know, I, I spoke really uh, harsh with you or whatever. I apologize. But then this is so true. And it's so true, you know, whether in the workplace, whether at home, whether in just relationships with people, if we will just tell ourselves, to, and I just practice this thing, just listen more, speak less, and tame your temper. Let's all say that together. Listen more. Speak less. Tame your temper. One more time. Listen more. Speak less. Tame your temper. Things will be so different in our relationships with people. But James tied this, ties this kind of behavior. He ties it in to the fact that we've been born again by the word of truth. Telling us that this is possible. This transformation is possible. For some of us, you know, it, it requires a, a major change in the way we've been carrying on. You know, for us to learn to listen more, speak less, and tame our temper. It may seem like, oh, that's, that's a big change for me. But it's possible because it's tied in to who you are as a new creation. You've been born of the word of truth, and this kind of life is possible. So, not only does he say that, but then he says, you know, we've been born of the word of truth, but we must continue to receive the word in our lives. So that's verse 21, James 1 and verse 21. So he says, we must continue to receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save our souls but in order to continue receiving this, this is James 1 verse 21. In order to continue receiving the implanted word, he says the first thing we must do is we must lay aside all filthiness and wickedness. That is all kinds of wrong things. Just lay aside the sin. You know, and this kind of ties in, if you will remember, to the parable of the sower. But Jesus is talking about the sower sowing the seed. And in one instance, he mentions that the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desire for other things, they choke the word. Do you remember that? The seed that falls among thorns. He says, you know, these things of this world, they choke the word. And so here in James 1.21, James is telling us, look, we need to lay aside these things in order to receive the implanted word to save our souls. Wait a minute. You're already born again. Verse 18. We've been born of the word of truth. But now he's talking, verse 21, being in order to save our souls. What does that mean? Am I not already saved? Well, your soul is different from your spirit. You know, every man is a tri, every human person is a tripart being, spirit, soul, and body. Your spirit is your inner person, the, the eternal part of you, the, the, the part of you that is born again when you receive Christ as your Savior. The soul is our mind, will, and emotions. The Greek word for soul is suke, which parallels the English, or English, we have the word psychology, or we talk about the mind, the will, the emotions. And that's what he's talking about. That the implanted word will save our soul, our mind, our will, our emotions. Are you with me? So you're born again. 
Yes, you've been born again by the word of truth. You're a new creation, but the soul needs to be saved. The soul, the mind, the will, the emotions need to be transformed. But in order to do that, we must receive the implanted word. Are you listening? The word has to come into our, us, get into us. But there are things that prevent the word from getting in. The wickedness, the sin, the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, the lust for other things. These things prevent that word from getting implanted to, into us. But once the word gets implanted into you and me, what does it do? It saves our soul. It transforms our mind, our will, and our emotions. Okay? So that's why the Word of God is so important. It can restore our soul, transform our soul, save our soul, our mind, will, and emotions. So verse 21, he says, you know, receive with meekness, with humility. Don't say, I know everything. No. We must say, God, there's things I need to learn. I need to know. Speak to me through your Word. And as we receive with meekness the implanted Word, it saves our soul. It transforms our mind, our will, and our emotions. It changes the psychological part of us just as the spiritual part of us has been transformed and born again by the Word of Truth. That's verse 21. And then he says, not only must we be receive the Word, Verse 22, but we must also be doers of the word. So you see how he's developing this. Verse 18, we are born again by the word. Verse 21, you receive the word. The, it, it transforms your soul. Verse 22, you and I must be doers of the word. Be a practitioner of the word. Be somebody who goes out and says, I will do what I'm hearing from the word of God. If we are only listeners of the word, but not doers of the word, James tells us we end up deceiving our own selves. Verse 22. We deceive our own selves. If you're just a listener to the word. And then, so, so you know, you can imagine, for instance, you know, suppose uh, you attend a course on nutrition, right? Example, you attend a little lecture or a course or whatever, you, you attend, and they tell you, these are the foods that are good for you. And Amy sent me recently an article to read, you know, on, okay, that's, we'll leave that article aside, but <laughs> on good food, food that is good for you, right? So, uh, so you, you, Read an article or you listen to a lecture or something on nutrition, food that is good for you. And I say, Wow, thank you. You go up to the person who gave the talk and say, Wow, that was, and I learned a lot today, amazing stuff. I know exactly what to eat and I know the things that I, and then you, the moment you leave the lecture hall, you go straight to, I don't know, wherever, you know, what are your favorite places? And KFC, whatever, you know. And uh, you do exactly the opposite of all that you heard. Then that information was of no, no use. Doesn't amount to any good, personally. Now, here in concerning the Word of God, James is saying, listen, if you hear the Word... You receive the word, but you've also got to progress to be a doer of the word. And if you don't do it, then what happens is you only end up deceiving your own self. You're only cheating or fooling your own self. You know, we all enjoy good sermons. We all enjoy, you know, good messages. We feel happy. Yes, it's good that, you know, your time was well spent. I mean, if you spent, you know, an hour or two hours here and, and you heard the word of God and your time was well spent. Thank God for that. But the purpose is not to hear a good sermon. The purpose is to go understand the word, learn the word, and then go and live by the word. 
And if we are only just hearers of the word, and you don't do the word, then we are just deceiving ourselves. I'll come back to that thought a little later uh, at the end of chapter 1. And then very interesting in, in, the, in this passage that we read, he says, you know, when you look into the word of God, it's like a person looking at a mirror. So it's a very interesting analogy or comparison. God's word is like a mirror. So when you look at a mirror, what happens? You, you get to know your natural self. You see things that you don't know about yourself, and you can take care of those things. And that's the way the Word of God is. And when you look into the Word, it's like looking into a mirror. God reveals things concerning you. There are things that need to be addressed or corrected, and other things that need to be recognized about yourself, and you affirm about yourself. Both happens when you look into the mirror of the Word of God. So when you look into the mirror of God's Word, you find out that, hey, I need to, you know, I need to set my hair, I need to do this, I need to do that. I just, and so you correct these things. But when you look into the mirror, you also understand what kind of person you are. This is who I really am. This is what I look like. And so the Word of God teaches you who you really are in Christ. And you go and live according to what you've seen yourself in the Word of God. But if you forget that, then it's like, a man who looks in the mirror and forgets things about himself. It didn't do him any good. So God's word is like a mirror. Are you all with me so far? That means we need to look into the word, but we need to address what we see. We need to take and use what is reflected back to us, so to speak. Another interesting thing that we see in this passage is in verse 25, where... James mentions, he refers to the Word of God as the perfect law of liberty. The perfect law of liberty. He will use this phrase once again in chapter 2. What is he talking about? The law of liberty, the perfect law of He who looks into the perfect law of liberty. Now remember, this is just about 12 years since the birth of the church. They don't have the New Testament yet. So he can't refer to something as New Testament. But what he's referring to as the perfect law of liberty is in contrast to the law that brought bondage. The law of Moses. So you can see emerging right here. And understanding that the new covenant that the Lord Jesus put in place is different from the law of Moses. And he contrasts that in chapter 2. So his Jewish audience who are now believers, they understand there is the law that brought bondage. But we are under the new covenant. This brings liberty. It's the perfect law of liberty. Are you with me? He's going to repeat that phrase again in chapter 2. But that's, he's referring to the new covenant as the perfect law of liberty. It brings freedom. The law of Moses brought bondage. It put a pressure on people. They couldn't keep it. They, you know, felt condemned. The perfect law of liberty sets us free, brings life, is redeeming. And so he refers to that in verse 25. And he says, if you and I look into the law of liberty, and then we continue in it, we do the work, then we are blessed in what he does. So, blessing comes by doing what the Word of God says. So, let's say this together. I am blessed as I do the Word. I am blessed as I do the Word. Amen? So, now we understand Pastor, I heard your sermons, I heard your sermons, I heard your sermons. Why am I not seeing anything happening? Well, you got to go beyond hearing. You got to get into doing. You receive the word. You hear the word. But blessing comes when you and I do the word. Practice the word. Apply it into your life. And that's what James is saying. So blessing comes when we do the Word of God. 
The last couple of verses here in James 1, is verses 26 and 27. If anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. So, and this is a theme or a truth that James is going to reference often. He says, you know, if you're really spiritual, if you're really spiritual, true religion, a true expression of spirituality is this. Ability to tame your tongue, to visit people in need. In this case, he specifically mentions orphans and widows, and to live unspotted from the world. Three things. True spirituality. In chapter 3, he'll once again come back to this. He says, if you're really mature, here's how we can tell you're really mature. One, you'll take control of your tongue. Two, you'll care for the poor, I mean, for those in need, orphans, widows. And third, you'll live separated from the world. He mentions this again in chapter 4. Are you listening? Yes? No? So says, this, is, this is how you really can show that you are a very spiritual person, a person who is who, devout, who really loves God, and so on. How? Tame your tongue. Help people in need. Orphans, widows. Chapter 2, he's going to talk about more. And then he says, live holy lives separated from the world. He says, that's an expression of true spirituality. That means you're really growing, maturing in your walk with God. Amen? So now, I know that for many of us, you know, uh, especially if you're in, in, in a church like this where, you know, we do emphasize spiritual things. We emphasize people being baptized in the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues, the gifts of the Spirit and the prophetic, you know. We emphasize all of those things. And, and then sometimes in our pursuit of those things, we forget the basic things. That when I see somebody in need, I need to help him. We are pursuing spiritual things, but we forget some basic things. That if there's somebody in need, you need to be there for them. Are you listening? So we're not saying, don't pursue those spiritual expressions, and you know, we do that. But don't forget the real expressions, the simplicity of this. Tame your tongue, care for those in need, and then live lives that are righteous and holy before God. Now, I want to just bring our attention to one thing in chapter 1 before we go into chapter 2. Three times in this one chapter, James talks about deceiving our own selves. So when you think about this, there was an angel, an archangel, meaning a chief angel. His name was Lucifer, which simply means son of the morning. He was in the very presence of God. He was in heaven. He was in the best place you could ever be, in the presence of God. There was nobody to tempt him. There was no junior Lucifer, <laughs> There was no one to tempt him. He was in the glory presence of God. There was worship in heaven, and he was in charge of worship. And yet, this angel, who was so perfect in beauty, who was so full of wisdom, who was in an absolutely perfect environment, yes, yet this angel sinned. 
What caused him to sin? One thing. It was self-deception. Who deceived the devil? See, we all blame the devil. The devil deceived me. Who deceived the devil? That is Lucifer. Before he became the devil. Who tempted him? Now, as the first sin was self-deception. Are you listening? He deceived his own self. Because he said in his heart, I will ascend up to God. I will be like the Most High. I will sit on the throne. Who deceived Lucifer? He deceived himself. Now why am I emphasizing that? Because in this first chapter in James 1, James warns us three times about self-deception. The first time is in verse 19. He says, look, if you and I are going to blame God for our temptation, we are deceiving ourselves. Or if we blame somebody else for the temptation we face, we are deceiving ourselves. The second time he brings self-deception up is in verse 22. So first one is verse 16. Second, sorry, James 1, 16. Second is in verse 22. He says, if you just listen to the word but don't do it, you're, self you're in self-deception. You're deceiving your own selves. The third time is when, we are, when he's talking about true religion. It's verse 26. He says, if you think you're spiritual, but you can't do these three things. You can't tame your tongue. You can't care for the needy. And you don't live unspotted from the world. You're deceiving yourself. Let me repeat it. Three self-deceptions that James warns us about in chapter 1. First, don't blame God or somebody else for the temptation you're facing. Take responsibility. Every man is tempted when he's drawn by his own desires. But if I'm blaming somebody else, or if I'm blaming God, I'm in self-deception. Second, if I'm only hearing the word but not doing the word, I am deceiving myself. Third, if I claim to be spiritual, but I don't tame my tongue, I don't care for the needy, and if I don't live separate from the world, I'm deceiving myself. Are you with me? This is very strong. Because self-deception was the one thing that caused Lucifer to fall. He was in the most perfect environment, and yet he sinned. In other words, you can be in all people's church, receive the best teaching, enjoy great worship, have wonderful believers all around you, but if you're self-deceived, God help you. Now, it's... It's not a nice place to be. It's not a nice place to be. Are you listening? So we need to be true to ourselves. We need to be true to God. And say, God keep me. From the self-deception. Because that's what caused Lucifer to fall. Chapter 2. Let's get into chapter 2. So. Let's read verses 1 through 9. James chapter 2, verses 1 to 9. Are you all with me so far? My brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. For if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings in fine apparel, and there should also come in a poor man in filthy clothes, and you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes, and say to him, you sit here in a good place and say to the poor man, you stand there or sit here at my footstool. Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brethren, has not God chosen, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom whom he, whom he promised to those who, which he promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Do not the rich oppress you and drag you into the courts? Do they not blaspheme that noble name by which you are called? If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, 
you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you do well. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. Wonderful passage. Nine verses. So relevant to us today. You know, we, this church, we call it All People's Church. Which means everybody is welcome. Amen? But we need to show it in practice. And this passage is so relevant. He says, you know, if a rich person, if a person who's very wealthy comes in and a person who's not so wealthy comes in, you know, you treat them, you must treat them equally. Now, of course, don't confuse this with honoring people. That means, of course, the Bible also teaches us to honor people. Honor your parents. Honor uh, those in leadership. Honor civic, civil authority. Honor those in spiritual uh, authority. And so there's that place of honor. But he's not dis discrediting honoring people. What he's talking about is preferential treatment, prejudice, partiality. Don't do that. Treat everybody equally, fairly. Especially, he says, in the house of God, in the assembly. Treat everybody equally. Are you with me? So let's try to practice that as a church. Right? So when people come in, we treat, treat everybody equally. Now, we've tried to do this from the very beginning as a church. And for instance, opportunities in the church are just given to everyone equally. If you want to serve in church, you're welcome. And everyone can serve. There is no like... You know, so-and-so is, you know, whoever. You know, we just treat everybody equally. No preferential treatment. For instance, if you want to be part of the worship team, one reason I'm not part of the worship team is because we all have to go through the same process. <laughs> you have to go through the audition. Everybody has to go through it. Right? There are well-established musicians, but they went through the audition. There are some new people. They go through the audition. Everybody goes through it. You do well, you meet that standard, you can be part of the worship team. But once you become part of the worship team, there are requirements. You got to show up for practice. If you don't show up for practice, there's nobody, you can't get a letter from pastor. That doesn't work here. Are you listening? So the rules apply to everybody. The rules or the, you know, the things that are set in place. We treat everybody fairly. We try to do that even as a congregation, you know, as a church. We try to create that as a culture of the church. That this is how we work with people. Treat everybody fairly. Treat everybody equally. All opportunities are available. Uh, nobody gets preferential treatment. Are you listening? So, we want to maintain that culture. We are practicing James chapter 2, verse 1 to 9. There's no partiality in how we relate to people and how we treat people, treat them. You know, and there are some, some, some practical things we do. For instance, our pastors don't know who tithes and who does not. That means you can come for and stand for prayer. Pastor doesn't know whether you're tithing or not tithing. Some churches, they check on you. But we don't do that here. Because when you come for prayer... It's not about whether you are tithing or not tithing. It's about you are somebody, we are here to serve you. So our pastors, none of our pastors know those, those, that, that financial details, not known. No, we, we don't need to know all of that. We are here to serve every person equally. Whether you give 100 rupees in the offering, or I'm just using money as an example, whether you give 100 rupees in the offering, or whether you give 100,000 in the offering, when you come for prayer, we are here to serve you. Are you listening? Right? That's it. Doesn't matter. So pastors don't know all those details. That's handled by our um, accounting staff. They handle those things. And we don't necessarily track all that. Uh, we don't need to do that. So, so that way they, we, we try to be as impartial to every person you know, uh, uh, in the congregation that we serve. 
whether you come in or not, uh, whether you, you know, ho whoever, your, whatever your social standing is, we all, we try to serve everybody equally. Now, that's the way we want to maintain. And that's the way we want, we should be in our relationships with people, right? Look at them as people. Look at them as people whom God has chosen. And James mentions four reasons why even, you know, whom who are people who may not be, you know, rich, economic, economically well off. He mentions four things here, and I'm just summarizing that. He says, look, the poor, this is verse 5, the poor have been chosen by God just as anybody else. The poor can be rich in faith just as anybody else. The poor are heirs of the kingdom just as anybody else. And the poor love the Lord just as much as anybody else. Are you listening? So just because they may be financially in a difficult position momentarily in that stage of life, doesn't mean they're any less in the faith. In fact, they are rich in faith. And so we honor that in their lives. Amen? Just a few side notes here. Um, in uh, verse number two, when James uses the word assembly, when a man comes into your assembly, very interesting, he uses the word, the Greek synagogue, rather than the Greek ecclesia. So when a man comes into your assembly. So this once again indicates to us that it kind of dates the writing. Right? The, ecle the idea of ecclesia had not yet come. That comes on a little later after, you know, Paul, they go on the first missionary journey and they establish ecclesia. That comes on a little later. So here, when James is writing, he's using the word synagogue. When somebody comes into your assembly, a synagogue, that's where they were just gathering still. The idea of ecclesia or the church, the local church, had yet not yet, you know, been established. So they kind of dates the, the writing as well. And now in verse 4 again, he says, uh, you know, uh, if you show partiality, you become judges with the evil thoughts. Or that means you uh, have become evil in your judging or in your reasoning. Now, th this does not mean we shouldn't judge people. Of course, Jesus taught us, you know, in John uh, 7 and verse 24, he said, judge righteous judgment. So you need to be discerning. You need to, you know, look into things carefully. But don't become a judge with evil reasoning. That is wrong. You judge impartially. Judge without preference. Judge without prejudice. Now, remember, this happened way back. I think I'm going back in time. You know, uh, uh, when we were in Christian Worker Center, so this is almost in our second year, I remember one person came and uh, he, you know, we were very small at those days. We were only about 60 some people. And this person came and uh, he had, come, you know, sons. Uh, I think I forget the exact number of sons. He had three, four sons. He came to me. He, he spoke to me just straight. He said, you know, yeah, these are my four boys. Uh, I would like them to be leaders in the church, and I would like to be on the trust. Straight on my face. And thank God, even though we were young in those days, we had enough wisdom to know that this is not something we'd fall for. No. He even took us out for lunch. And he said, you know, this is what I want in this church. And he, we were small. He, he, he thought he could have position and his boys could have. I mean, I didn't tell him straight in his face, but I said, that won't happen here in my mind. You know, and sure enough, they promptly left the church when they saw that that doesn't happen. Are you listening? In other words, from the very beginning, we were careful, you know. We're going to keep things equal for everybody. Nobody can get any position in the church just because of whatever. You know, everybody goes through the same process. So now, so you have to judge, but don't judge with evil reasoning. Judge impartially, judge fairly, judge, as Jesus said, with righteous judgment. From verse 6, you can find out that when we 
treat people with prejudice, we dishonor the person. Verse 6, he says, you've dishonored the poor man. So you dishonor people when you treat them uh, out of prejudice or uh, impartiality. And, you, and you know, you're, you're being unfair. Now, of course, James mentions here, in, you know, how the rich in those days treated uh, people. They disrespected the noble name of the Lord. They even took people to court. Um, they oppressed people. And so James says, look, sometimes they will end up doing that. You know, and, and this was what they did in those days. Now, verse 8, just to comment here, he says, you know, if you, fulfill, you really fulfill the royal law, and he's quoting from Leviticus 19, verse 18, the Old Testament, which Jesus reaffirmed in the New Testament, the second commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. But James calls this the royal law. This is the royal law. It could mean two things. One, this is the law that God wants for us, the king's law, the law that comes from the king. Or he could, it could also mean this is the, the chief of all the laws, the royal law. What is it? Love your neighbor as yourself. And how you, one way that you can tell that you're loving your neighbor as yourself is when you treat that person without partiality, without prejudice. Are you with me? Now, you know, we could spend more time on this, but, I, but let's look at some practical scenarios. How do you treat somebody if they came to church with torn jeans and long hair? Right? Or with some rings and piercings and tattoos on their body. But he said, man, he's straight, going straight to hell. <laughs> or would you treat him without prejudice? Look at who he is on the inside rather than looking on the outside. Would you be able to welcome him and say, wow, he could be a prophet of God. So, but how can a prophet wear torn jeans, tattoos? Well, why do you look on the outside? Because God does not look as man looks. God looks on the out, uh, man looks on the outside, but God looks at the heart. What would you do if a young person walked in, stinking, like he smells like he hasn't had bath for, for a long time? And he comes and stands next to you and he lifts up his hand to worship God. <laughs> what would you do? Would you think like, man, APC is gone. <laughs> You're judging the whole congregation based on one person who happened to come that day to worship God. I'm just talking about other kinds of prejudice. You know, James is obviously talking about uh, a rich and the poor, but I'm just talking about other kinds of prejudice, things that we have in our mind by which we judge people. And these are all things that do happen. Are we able to see gold in, even in that person who looks rough on the outside, but he could be rich in his faith, or he or she could be rich in their faith, are we able to remove the filters that we have on our eyes and see them through God's eyes? Are you listening? Now, I'm not talking about being indecent or anything like that. I'm just talking about just, look, this happens. What if somebody comes in and, and, and you know, would, you, would we receive that person? Would we encourage that person to know Christ or grow in the faith or uh, even accept that that person could be strong in the faith even though on the outside they look a little different? Could we do that? Can we lay aside our prejudice and try to see what's really inside the person and appreciate them for who they are rather than judging them by what we see on the outside? Now let's push this a little further. What if somebody came in who was a homosexual? 
gay, lesbian. They came into church. What would you do? Would it change the role in which you're sitting? Would you welcome that person? Would you let them come to church? What would you do? So, Pastor, this may never happen. No, 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 no. We are living in a day and a time when things like this will happen. It's not, will not happen. It probably has happened. So what would we do? You know, would we let them worship God with us in this church? Or would we say, sorry, no place for you? Now, here's the point. We are not going to change what is right and wrong. We, we are not going to do that. We are not going to change what the Word of God teaches concerning uh, homosexuality or you know, that kind of life. You know, God says it's wrong, it's wrong. But what if a person comes in like that? Can we still love the person? We're not condoning what they're doing or the lifestyle, what they claim to believe, but can we love the person? Can we look for gold in the person and say, God, can, you know, can, can that person sense love or will that person sense rejection from the church? How would we treat them? I'm not saying we're going to change our teaching. No, we're not going to change that. We're not going to change the truth. But can we show grace? Can we show mercy? Can we show love? Can we show compassion? Will you still shake their hand? Will you still sit next to them? Will you still have a conversation with them? Will you still take them out for lunch? Will you still buy them their meal? Even if they say they're homosexual. Would you do that? Think about it. Amen? It's not a question if, it's a question a matter of when such things will happen. How will we react to them? How will they know the love of Jesus Christ if we are not there to show it to them? If we reject them, if we despise them, if they don't feel welcome. Because if they don't come here, where will they get deliverance? Where will they get help? Where will they hear the truth if you don't give them a seat to sit here? Are you listening? We're not changing what the Bible says. We're not changing the truth that we proclaim. We're not going to change our standards. But can we still love people like this? So, what James is saying is, we are fulfilling the royal law, love your neighbor as you love yourself. When we treat people without prejudice, without partiality, we are fulfilling the royal law, the chief of all the rules. But if we don't, then we are a transgressor. We have broken the law. James chapter 2. Let's try to just... Oh, it's already 12.30. Um, worship team, please come. I think we have to stop here. But it's okay. So, we'll pause here. I'm probably behind, way behind all the other locations. But we will do our best to go forward here. James chapter 2, we'll pick up from verse 10 next Sunday. James 2, verse 10. So, okay. So, today we talked about the Word of God, how we must receive the Word. We are born again by the Word, we receive the Word, but we must be doers of the Word. We saw that true religion, true spirituality is expressed 
when we tame our tongue, when we care for poor, the needy, and when we live separated from the world. And we also saw from James chapter 2, verses 1 through 9, that we must treat people without prejudice, without partiality. And we fulfill the royal law when we love them as we would love ourselves. Amen. So we're going to take a few moments now just to worship, just to look to God. Now I feel like we could just go on, but we are going to stop here. Let's rise up to our feet, please. And before we just sing together, could you take a few moments just to pray? Say, Lord, pray about the, whatever you've heard, what, whatever ministered to your heart this morning. I know we cover different things. I take a few moments just to pray. If there's something that you heard this morning from the Word of God that spoke to your heart, pray about that. It may be one thing, maybe two, maybe three. There are things that got your attention. That is God speaking to you. Just talk to him about it. Say, God, maybe I need to be somebody who listens more, talks less, and tames my temper. Maybe I need to be somebody who stops blaming somebody else for my falling into temptation and take responsibility. Don't blame God, don't blame somebody else. But realize you've got to deal with desires in your own body. Whatever it is today that God spoke to you from his word, just take a few moments to pray. Father, we just invite you by your Spirit to work in each of our hearts. Things that we need to be done in our lives today. Work in our hearts. Father, we ask that even now in these few moments as we stand before you, that you will manifest your works. Manifest your power to heal, to deliver. Even as we have heard your word, Manifest your works by your Spirit. Father, where there needs, where the things have to change, let them change. Maybe in our thinking, maybe in the way we've been relating to people, let them change. Let things change. If we've been in a place of self-deception, God, today, let that self-deception be rooted out, set us free from it. 
we will stop deceiving our own selves. As we sing this song, I want to encourage you to just expect God to do a work in your life. If you need healing in your body, your mind, your emotions, attitudes, temperament as we spoke about, I know there's a practical side that we must do. You learn some skills to manage your temper or to become a good listener or a better communicator. Those are skills you can develop. That's something we can do. But God can heal you and touch you supernaturally as well. So as we sing this song, invite the Lord to heal. Invite the Lord to deliver, to do something in your life as we sing this song. Let's do that, please. Hold my every moment You calm my raging seas You walk with me through fire And heal all my disease You hold, you hold my every Every moment you calm my raging seas, you walk with me through fire and heal all my disease. I trust. I drew. 
let's take a moment to pray together. And Father, I just pray for the healing, for the deliverance that's needed in this place and for those watching online, God. Father, I pray it will take place right now. In the name of Jesus, just lay your hand. It's a very simple thing I'm asking you to do. If you need healing in your body, just lay your hand, if possible, on the place where God, that you need God to heal you. Or you could place you just, just hold your hands together and say, Lord, I receive my healing. Father, right now, in Jesus' name, God, whatever the need of healing, whatever that need of deliverance, administer it to people by your Spirit. By your Spirit. That healings and miracles take place right now in the name of Jesus. I take authority over tumors and growths and cysts. And I command these things to disappear in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That God, people who have been given a report of a tumor or a growth or a cyst in their body that's causing problems, let those things just disappear in the name of Jesus. Lord God, we just speak your healing, your deliverance right now. If somebody has had had an impact on your face right here on on your left side, right here, and because of that impact on your face, you're having problems. But even now, the Lord Jesus Christ heals you. So just receive that healing. So Lord, I thank you that the, the injury caused by that impact. The pain, the injury is reversed. God heals you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, even now, by the authority of Jesus' name, let chronic illnesses, chronic conditions be broken off of people's bodies. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the healing power of God be administered to people. Just want you to pray and say, Lord, I receive my healing. I receive my healing. Father, we thank you for your mighty words. Thank you. I speak to diabetic conditions and I command healing in the name of Jesus. arthritic conditions or pain in the joints and I command healing in the name of Jesus I rebuke every spirit of infirmity I command it to leave and let healing take place in people's bodies I thank you Father thank you Before we close right now, if there's anyone here, you've never received Jesus Christ into your life, you've never been born again, those of you watching online, if you've never received Jesus into your life, if you don't know what it means to be a new person, to have a new life, new life in Christ, I want to lead you in a simple prayer so that you can receive Christ, be born again, and have new life that comes from God. I just want you to pray this prayer with me right where you are and you feel like you need to do this just say this with me Lord Jesus come into my life I want to be born again I want new life that you give forgive my sins make me a child of God and help me to follow you and you alone the rest of my life. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Anybody, you prayed this prayer with me for the very first time in the auditorium here today. If you prayed this prayer with me for the very first time, could you just raise your hand, please, so that we could just celebrate with you. Anybody in this auditorium, you prayed this prayer with me for the very first time. Can I see your hands? Anybody? Anybody who prayed this prayer with me for the very first time? 
Okay, I don't see any hands. That's all right. If you did, I want you to please meet with the ushers. They're standing at the back with bags. Uh, we call it the new believers bag. They have a little card that says decision card. So if there's anybody here, you pray this prayer with me for the very first time. On your way out, just meet with them and say, you know, I want the bag. And just write your name on that card and give it back to them. And we will be in touch with you. Let's receive our benediction and we will dismiss. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the sweet fellowship of His Holy Spirit be with each of us always. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for listening. We trust this message was a blessing to you. For more free resources, including sermons, sermon notes, and books, please visit apcwo.org. For information on APC Bible College in Bangalore, visit apcbiblecollege.org. Do remember to download the All People's Church Bangalore app from the Apple or Google Play Store.